right now is the time for the kids to come forward. Kids of all ages are welcome to come up. You're all welcome to come forward. So if you could sit right here and make room for everybody, that would be great. Come on in and have a seat. Come on in. Good to see you. Kids of all ages are welcome. Come on up. Oldberg ladies, can you guys move forward a little bit so they can get in? Excellent. Come on in. Have a seat. It is so good to see you guys, eyes on me. We are talking about a really important story today. We're continuing our series called This Is Your Backstory, where we meet three siblings, Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. And what we're going to see is that Moses has a special relationship with God. He can talk to God, in, in God's words, face to face, kind of like I'm talking now. But sometimes we have people in our life that are far away, and we need to communicate over great distances. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen, and I want you to raise your hand and tell me what type of communication those represent. So Marissa, can we see the first one, please? So raise your hand. What does that type of communication represent? Shouting. Shouting. Good job. Let's see the next one, please, Marissa. Does anyone know what that represents? That's a historical monument out west. Aiden, do you know what type of communication that is? Yeah, it's actually, have you ever heard of the Pony Express? They used to carry letters from rider to rider, and they were actually letters, so that would be called snail mail today. Yeah, let's try another one. Does anyone know what that is called? Ben Miller. Oh, yes, it was used with Morse code, but what is that actual instrument called? Do you remember? A telegraph, that's right. And so they would lay these copper wires and you'd go, and then another person on the other end listening and they'd use Morse code to communicate. Let's see another one. Maybe you've seen one of these before at your great, 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 great grandpa's house. What is it? It is a telephone. That's the way they used to look. You would stick your the little thing to your ear and you'd crank it and then you talk into the thing. That's what they originally looked like. Let's see the next one. Does anyone know what this is? Kids, do you know what this is? What is that? What kind of telephone? Okay. An electric telephone? Good. This is called a cell phone. Now, originally they were called bag phones and they were on a big bag and you'd stick them in your car and plug them into your cigarette lighter, but now they're so tiny they used to be huge. So those, that's an old cell phone. Can we see another one please, Marissa? Does anyone know what that type of communication is called, you know? Video chat or teleconferencing. You used to have to do it on a big TV. Now I know kids, you'll know this last one. What is this? Raise your hand. Don't shout it out. What is that called? Do you know? FaceTime. That's right. Where now you can have a little phone and you can talk to a person, but still, there's one better way of communicating. Final picture, please, Marissa. Can we see that? Does anyone know what this image represents? Yes. Talking face to face, the way that I'm talking to you now. And what we're going to see is, is that Moses siblings were jealous because Moses had a special relationship with God. And what we're going to see is that Moses was able to talk to God face to face. And so that's what we're talking about. So I have two jobs for you guys this morning. If you have a dad or grandpa that's here, each of you are going to take one bag of plain M&M's, not peanut, plain M&M's for your father. And then you can grab a piece of candy for yourself. So good job listening, guys. If you attend preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Everyone else, if you can open up your Bibles to the book of Numbers, we're going to be in chapter 12 today. Good job, guys. Don't forget some M&Ms for the man in your life. And don't worry if you don't have any young kids at the children's sermon, we will be passing out. Say you're, you're like, dude, dad, I'm sorry. I've got the M&Ms for you. Good job, guys. Good job. If you're a guest with us here today, thank you so much for joining us on this Father's Day. We're excited that you're here, and we're excited. Kids are all turned around. That's okay. All right. Good job. We're excited that you're here because we're continuing our series called This Is Your Backstory. And what we've learned over the last couple of weeks is that the main story, we're talking about the most important story in all of history is the perfect life, 
the atoning sacrifice, and the victorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. However, that story makes a whole lot more sense if we understand what came before. So I'm going to start this this way. So let's go, and if you haven't gotten any M&Ms, watch out for this guy, he'll take five or six. But go ahead and, and, and pass one out there. And what we're going to see today is, last week we talked about this young man named Joseph. And remember, Joseph was given the ability by the Lord to dream dreams that would actually come true. But you remember that his siblings didn't treat him very well at all. And even though some terrible things happened to Joseph, he realized that all of these things that can be worked together for his good and that for God's people. Today we meet another group of siblings who weren't getting along. Aaron, who was the oldest, Miriam was the middle child, and young Moses. This is the same person that was called by God to free the people, of, uh, the Hebrew people, out of slavery in Egypt. The same person who led God's people through the parting of the Red Sea. The same person who had given God's people the Ten Commandments and set up the tabernacle. What we're going to see today is a part of the story where God's people are about to send spies into the Promised Land. And so the book we look at is known in our Bible as Numbers. From a Hebrew perspective, they know this book as in the wilderness. And that's really a good and appropriate title to look at this book because it takes place while God's people, we can find out, be wandering in the wilderness for something like 40 years. But as I tried to illustrate with the kids, one of the unique things that Moses had was this ability to communicate with God in a way that really no one since Adam and Eve were able to, and that was face to face. And so he had a special role. Marissa, quickly see that role. It's called covenant mediator. A mediator is a go-between. He is one who stands between two or more persons or groups who are in a dispute and tries to reconcile them. In biblical terms, human beings are described as being at enmity against God. So we rebel, revolt, and refuse to obey the, the law of God. And as a result, God's wrath is upon us. And so Moses provided a much-needed go-between for God's people. So keep that in mind as we take a look at chapter 12 in Numbers. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Huh? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? But the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And at once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out of that tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of a cloud. He stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both of them had stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face. Clearly, not in riddles, for he sees the form of the Lord. So, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And so the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. But when the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, leprous, like snow. Aaron turned towards her and saw that she had leprosy. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, do not hold against us the sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her to be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. Oh. Moses cries out to the Lord, Oh God, please, Heal her. The Lord replies, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Oh, confine her outside of the camp for seven days, and after that, she can be brought back. So sure enough, Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move until she was brought back. After that, the people left Hezeroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. And so there's an important movement of God about to take place. 
And whenever something amazing is going to happen within God's people, oftentimes there's an attack. Those attacks come from the outside, but they also sometimes come from within. In the very previous chapter, in chapter 11, we see God's people doing what they do best. They complain, right? After they left Egypt and they're in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, they're always whining. They're always complaining. And that the most recent complaint was they wanted some meat. We're tired of this bread. We need some meat. And so what did God do? He brought quail. We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of quail to feed God's people. And yet as we look at today's passage, we see instead of just the complaining coming from the general public, now we see the complaining, the undermining coming from Moses' own family. Now it's important to point out in verse 1 the way that the Hebrew is lined up. Miriam's name is first. And the verb for to talk against is in the feminine, which shows us that Miriam was leading this undermining of Moses' leadership. Sure, Aaron was participating, but it was really Miriam who was kind of trying to take away something that the Lord had given Moses. And so she uses this opportunity, saying that he just married a Cushite wife. So clearly, at some point, Moses' first wife, Zipporah, must have died. And not wanting to be alone, he remarried a Cushite wife, which nowhere in Scripture do we say that God's people couldn't marry those folks. But yet, that new person in the community caused her to feel threatened, caused Aaron to feel threatened, to feel like their role was somehow not good enough anymore. And so they use this as an opportunity to speak against the person that the Lord has put into leadership. They said, well, hasn't the Lord only, has he only spoken through Moses? Really? Is he the only one who God speaks to? And they added to it saying, hasn't he also spoken through us? Are we important too? That Moses, he thinks he's so special. It was basically at the heart of their questioning. Now, Miriam was a prophetess. She had an important role in God's chosen family. Aaron was the high priest, and yet they looked at their roles, and, and they started to become envious. And they started to cause conflict. And they tried to undermine the person that God had put in leadership over the people. But look what happened. The Lord heard this. Now it's Father's Day. Now I'm sure none of this has ever happened with fathers in our church community. But sometimes you may remember kids will be roughhousing in the house, right? Maybe the father and mother are in another room, and then one of the parents says, hey, if you guys don't cut it out, someone's going to get hurt, or someone's going to get broken. And so the kid's are like, yeah, we'll be okay. So the, in another room, right, you hear the kids messing around, all of a sudden, crash, bang. <laughs> and as a kid, do you remember the doom, 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 doom. What are you kids doing? I heard everything that was happening. Get out of here and let me talk to you about it. That's exactly what happened. Aaron and Miriam were speaking against Moses, and the Lord heard every word. Uh-oh. Now, before we look at the Lord's response, we see this parenthetical statement in verse 3. Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now, this is strange because some scholars say, well, if Moses wrote the book of Numbers, why would he be talking about himself? But we have to understand what he meant by humility. Marissa, could you please see that slide? Humility, of course, has nothing to do with being downtrodden, weak, and going through life with an ever-ready apology merely for taking up space. Humility is the recognition of the all-important theological fact of who God is and who we are. It is a recognition of our dependence on God. So that describes Moses very well. And once that is established, the Lord says to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, come out of that tent of the meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. Throughout the Old Testament, when the Lord, when the presence of the Lord would show up, there'd be like a flame, right? So we have a candle in. But there can also be a, a, a pillar of cloud. Now, if God's fullness showed up, everybody in the camp would drop dead because of His glory and majesty. But He needed to address this, and so He comes down from heaven in a pillar of the cloud, stood at the entrance, and summoned Aaron and Miriam. And can you imagine how they were feeling? Step forward. 
Oh man, we're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. And look at what the Lord says. He says, listen to these words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. We saw that last week with Joseph, right? The Lord revealed his purpose and plan for Joseph in dreams. Now, if you've ever had a dream that was very vivid, you know it's, it's sometimes kind of hazy and you think, was that a dream or was that the Lord trying to say something to me? That's how the Lord usually communicates to his people, right? Just like those telegraphs and even, tele and even FaceTime. Let's face it, if you don't have good internet or cell coverage, that's a terrible way to communicate with people. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all of my house. In fact, there it is. With him I speak face to face. Marissa, can we see that slide, please? With Moses I speak face to face. Now there it is. In Hebrew, it literally says mouth to mouth. The emphasis of this line is clear enough. In human communication, this would mean the equality of rank. But Moses is certainly not equal in rank with the Lord. And yet God is here stating that Moses has an immediacy and a directness with communicating with God. It goes beyond the idea of friendship, almost that a king's confidant. So that makes a whole lot of sense. That he speaks to Moses clearly, not the riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. We know in, I think it's Exodus 33, Moses is saying, hey Lord, show me your glory. I, I want to see you. And God says, dude, if I show up, you're going to die. But here, let's do this. I'm going to show up and then I'm going to walk past you and then you can look to see where I just was. And so clearly the Lord allowed Moses to see a part of God which was so unique to the people that he was leading. And so with all of this laid out, you can imagine the voice gets deeper and says, then why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Didn't you know the unique... Well, are you feeling okay right now? I want you to come back next Sunday. It is Father's Day. I'm not trying to chew you out. But imagine, did you see Bart's face kind of get small? He's a tough guy. And yet when someone says something like that to you, how are you supposed to feel? Clearly they understood what they had done wrong. We see in verse 9, the anger of the Lord burned against them. And he left. And now we look at this last section. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam covered in leprosy. Now leprosy is a terrible, terrible disease where your skin cells start to die and patches of skin and body parts just kind of fall off. It's kind of gruesome, right? Vanessa, if I was to walk up to you and all of a sudden, poof, there goes my ear. Wouldn't that be disgusting? It was a terribly contagious disease because you wouldn't want to talk to your friends and family and say, oh, I can't go near you. I don't want to catch that terrible disease. And instantly, Miriam is covered with leprosy, head to toe. Aaron turns towards her, saw that she has leprosy, and he says to Moses, notice he doesn't go directly to God. He goes to the covenant mediator. And he says, please, my Lord, do not hold against us this sin. They admit that they did it wrong, so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a st stillborn infant. Just a graphic illustration. Moses cries out to the Lord. It would be great. I'm gonna be, you're going to be the leprous person here. It would be great if Bart had leprosy, if Moses could just go, yo, he you. Okay? But again, he's leprous. He'd be like, oh, I can't believe I just touched you. That's disgusting. Right? So what does Moses do? He does the right thing and he pleads to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her. Look at the Lord's response. For Father had spit in her face, would she not been in disgrace for seven days? No. Confine her outside the camp for seven days, and after that she could be brought back. Now that may seem kind of harsh to our ears, right? You know, Miriam and Aaron, they're only saying, aren't we important too? But no, what the heart of the matter was they were trying to undermine the person that the Lord had put in the leadership position. God knew that there's something called a chain of command, right? That in the military, that the chain of command is protected so clearly because if the chain of command is broken, people die. And before God's people could go into the promised land, he needs to remind God's people what the chain of command is. And so Miriam, unfortunately, needed to be an example for all of God's people to see. Sure enough, after seven days of being out of the camp, the people did not move until she was brought back, which means 
she was healed. So in conclusion, think back to the children's room a minute. Marissa, can we see, please? Please see that. One of the best and perfect ways for us to communicate with each other is face to face. Just like you and I are talking right now. Yet sometimes in life we can't do that. Sometimes it's distance, but oftentimes we can't communicate to people because there's sin in the relationship. Where's the group? Please see that. And what we see throughout Scripture is every time we sin against God or any time we sin against another person, it's almost like there's another brick in this wall that separates us between us and that other person or us with God. And we can't hurt or hurt or hurt or hurt. It becomes kind of muddled. So clearly Moses was needed to be that mediator between God who is holy and his people who are filthy and dirty. But even Moses understood that he fell short. He wasn't perfect. He messed up all the time. And so he understood that, that God had to do something else. Marissa, can we please see that? He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. And notice what Moses says, you must listen to him. So who was Moses talking about? We see that an effective mediator is one who is able to make peace between parties who are in conflict or estranged from each other. This is the role that Jesus performed as our perfect mediator. The Apostle Paul declared that we have peace with God through Christ's work of reconciliation. The mediating work of Christ is superior to all of our mediators. Moses was the mediator of the Old Covenant. He served as God's go-between, giving the Israelites the law. But Jesus is superior to Moses. And so in closing, let's look at just one example of how Jesus was superior, and he was the perfect mediator who communicated to God's people face to face, and he even healed a person with leprosy. And so we see from the Gospel of Luke, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along. He was covered, Bart, can I pick on you one more time? He was covered in leprosy, which means that he was in the advanced stages of the disease. His nose was falling off, his fingers were falling off. It was gruesome. Clearly, you don't want to go near this guy. What happened? When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground, not only as a sign of reverence, but he understood that he had no standing to look at Jesus face to face. And so he fell on the ground. What did he say? He begged Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, not, maybe you could do something for me. No. With confidence and faith, he said, you can make me clean. And so shockingly, Jesus reached out his hand. Remember, leprosy is incredibly contagious. And yet, he reached out his hand, his healing hand, and touched the man. But he did it, even though it was contagious. I am willing, Jesus said, to be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices. Oh, there's the old covenant mediator that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more. So that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But notice Luke ends with the note. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Why? Because Jesus understood, as Moses understood, his utter dependence on God the Father. That Jesus could not be the perfect mediator without going off and saying, Lord God, this is really hard. The people here are, are covered with sickness and there's so much conflict be between them and, and us. I need your strength. And so he would go off and remind himself and all of God's people that we too need to be utterly dependent on God. We should long for the day where we can talk to Jesus face to face. One day, those that are in Christ will go to heaven and we will be able to talk to him like you're talking to me. But until he returns, until he calls us home, we have this amazing gift of God, the Holy Spirit, that intercedes on our behalf. And when we're going through a tough time, when we feel that there's attacks and conflict, we could say to the Lord, Lord, please, I need to see your work in my life. I need to see you. Please hear my cry. And the Holy Spirit brings those prayers to the face of God. 
And the Holy Spirit carries back that encouragement through other people, through our prayers, through His Word, to say, you know what? You're not alone. I know this is hard, but we can get through this together. And so we should long for His presence. We're grateful for your presence with us here today on this Father's Day. And I encourage you in the days and the weeks to come, look for areas where God is calling you to be, to long and bring His presence here on earth. Please pray with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this amazing passage that gives us this understanding of the unique relationship that you have with your people. Lord, we thank you and we long for the day where we could be in your full presence talking to you face to face. But until that time, Lord, help us to not only be grateful for your Holy Spirit, but to take advantage of this amazing way to communicate with you, even to the far reaches of the earth, even in the, the depths of despair, we can cry out to you as Abba Father. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.